Well, thanks everyone for uh, joining us today. Um, it's great to have people here in person, and I know we also have a number of people online. Uh, and today we're talking about Arctic governance, Arctic cooperation. Uh, over the last few days, we've been hosting a workshop here, and we just couldn't not take advantage of having some amazing experts here. So we have four uh, people I'm going to introduce you to, but I always want to acknowledge the many people still in the room and, and I encourage them from the workshop to feel free to engage in the conversation uh, once we get into the, the question and answer because there are, this is a re remarkable group. Um, so uh, I want to start by surveying the group it's, uh, and I'll, I'll ask for the people online, this will be a test for whether they're actually there, um, <laughs> is raise your hands if you're actually, if you've done work related to Arctic governance, research, experience, and, and work, raise your hand. We just want to get a sense of the, the group that we're sort of surveying, and online as well, maybe you can announce for us. Nobody, nobody online. No, we've got about 15 people online raising their hands. Okay, oh, 15 people online, of, okay, so a lot more. So something to keep in mind, we're going to keep this very sort of high level introductory, but if you have particular questions that you would like to pose to this group because of their level of expertise, feel free. I'm going to ask a, a fairly quick round of introductory questions, but I am going to open the floor uh, for people online and in person uh, to ask your questions. So give, keep that in mind as we move forward. But to get us started, I'm going to ask each panelist to introduce themselves and to tell us how they got interested in the Arctic and Arctic governance. And I'll start with Fran Ulmer. Hello, everyone. My name is Fran Ulmer, and I am a resident of Alaska. And although Alaska has only been a state since 1959, it is a place that has a rich culture of indigenous people who have lived there for thousands and thousands of years. Since I have been in Alaska, I've been involved in a lot of different ways of helping people around the world understand why the Arctic matters, which is why I hope some of you came today because you're curious about that, and we'll talk about that. Hi, everyone. I'm Svaini Rotten from the Critics National Institute in Norway. So it was really a no-brainer starting up with Arctic issues. So uh, in fact, I have my PhD from uh, what they call the Arctic capital of Tromsø. So you should visit sometime. Now I live in Oslo, I'm still engaged in Arctic issues and especially the Arctic Council. So thanks. Thank you for the opportunity, Jennifer. My name is Ilana Wilson Rowe. I'm a research professor at the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs, where I head up our Center for Ocean Governance. I'm also an associate professor at the Norwegian University of Life Sciences. Um, my interest in the Arctic, I think, has come first and foremost via an engagement with Russia, studying Russian and geography in college, attending the Center for Northern Studies, one of the pioneering institutions that I think has led to a lot of the Arctic educational opportunities we have today. It's a long time just fascinated by the Bering Strait, which is actually one of the few places in the Arctic I've never been, unfortunately, <laughs> and done more field work in northern Canada and northern Russia, and then a move to Norway to work. And so I think for me, at least, the thing that's kept me fascinated is I think the Arctic is, of course, what happens there is incredibly important for the peoples and communities of the, the North. It's important globally. And I think it's also a place where we're going to talk more about it, where there have been some interesting, very important innovations in governance, from kind of decolonizing some of international relations through involving the indigenous, making sure that the indigenous peoples of the region can speak for themselves on the in international stage. And also using, trying to use, sometimes failing, sometimes succeeding the best of science and knowledge to come up with good policies. Mm -hmm. And so I think we're going to be seeing, the reason I, I think it's important in and of itself, but I also think we're probably going to see where the Arctic has some lessons for how to manage and govern in a period of planetary change also elsewhere in the world. So a lot to keep, keep one's interest. Thank you. Thanks very much. Hi, everyone. My name is David Bolton. I currently work in the White House, where I run an effort to coordinate U.S. government policy across some 18 to 20 different federal agencies. I spent most of my career, though, at the U.S. State Department as a diplomat and a lawyer working, among other things, on Arctic issues. But my very first experience 
uh, on anything remotely Arctic was shortly after I graduated from here as an undergraduate in the early 80s, I spent a summer rolling dough in a Chuck E. Cheese Pizza Time Theater on Northern Lights Boulevard in Anchorage, Alaska. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Back to you, Dan. <laughs> I don't know how to talk that. No. Um, I know, I just realized I didn't introduce myself as so I was passing the mic along. So I'm Jennifer Spence. I'm a senior fellow here at the Harvard Kennedy School Belfer Center's Arctic Initiative, and that's a mouthful right now. Um, and I have a PhD in public policy. Um, and my interest in the Arctic was very much, I worked for the actually the Canadian government for 20 years. Um, and in that time, I worked in many different capacities, but really uh, a lot around conflict ma management, resource management, um, and working with Indigenous peoples in Canada. Um, and so when I went to do a PhD, I really became attracted to the innovation that I saw and, and the potential of the Arctic. And as that evolved, I would say the Arctic, uh, I, I really agree with Alana, has so much to offer in terms of sort of looking at complexity and the confluence and the interconnections of things. Um, and so, and, and for me, the interface between science and policy is incredibly important. And so being able to use my expertise, both as a, a former policymaker and my experience as an academic, I really feel that opportunity to to advance uh, good quality uh, policy. So, um, oh, and I, I, having just finished working with the Arctic Council as the executive secretary of the Sustainable Development Working Group, um, this is a real opportunity to to continue to to work on this in a in a difficult time. And hopefully, we'll talk a little bit more about that. So. So it's great to have you all here. Um, my question for Brand is going to start us off, um, and we've started to hear some of the answer. But uh, why should people in international relations be interested in the Arctic? Well, I didn't mention that for ten years I chaired the U.S. Arctic Research Commission, and it is at least in part because of the experience that I had as a commissioner understanding the connection between science and policy that gives me the opportunity to share with you kind of four of the literally dozens of reasons why people who are interested in international relations might be interested in the Arctic. And let's start with defense. Alaska and the Arctic is a very strategic location. Matter of fact, in February of 1935, General Billy Mitchell declared that Alaska was the most strategic place of anywhere in the world. Why is that? Because if you're sitting in Anchorage, Alaska, and you fly to Tokyo, to Europe, or to Washington, D.C., it takes you exactly six hours. <laughs> So we hold the globe in the wrong way. <laughs> the equator isn't the center of the world, actually. In many ways, the Arctic is. So from a natural defense perspective, it's a very strategic location. And it's not only people in the Arctic who have sort of become aware of that. It is increasingly the world that is paying attention to the strategic location. That's number one. Number two, the Arctic is a critical ecosystem for planetary health. And when I say that, I mean that in a lot of ways, biodiversity, I mean it from the standpoint of climate health. It's a climate regulator. The amount of ice and snow contributes either in a positive or a negative way to the temperatures of the globe. Again, we could talk an hour about that, but let's just say it's an incredibly important area from the standpoint of planetary health as well. Number three, it's an emerging economic region with rich natural resources, oil and gas and fisheries and on and on. And again, that used to be sort of a secret among just a few companies in a few countries. And now more and more of the world has realized that and oh, by the way, more and more of the world has access to it because with less sea ice, it is easier from the standpoint of shipping and from the standpoint of access to get there and have the opportunity for natural resource development. And number four, the Arctic is demographically diverse with rich indigenous cultures 
And that also brings with it the rich in knowledge that comes from indigenous systems and an understanding of the natural world. So those are four of the reasons that people globally have an interest in and potentially impacted by the changes that are happening in the Arctic. And that certainly has many international and geopolitical ramifications. Long answer, sorry. No, nope, was, that was excellent. Four. Thanks very much, Fran. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, we, there's sort of, um, for the Arctic Council geeks, or Arctic geek, geeks, there's definitely a real focus on the Arctic Council when we think of governance. Um, so I'm going to ask uh, Spain to, to talk to us. The Arctic Council, which is recognized as a leading intergovernmental forum in the Arctic, what does it do? And what are some of its unique governance features? Thank you, Jen. Uh, the Arctic Council is by all Arctic states, including Russia, um, trade as the most important international forum of cooperation. So it's important in that sense. So all Arctic strategies states the Arctic Council as the most important uh, international forum. Uh, March last year, uh, the work of the Arctic Council was paused uh, due to the full scale invasion of uh, Russia into Ukraine. So, uh, so I would say that this will, might be the most severe blow to Arctic cooperation in, in, in decades, really. Uh, but for those not familiar with the Arctic Council, the Arctic Council consists of eight member states. There are eight Arctic states, uh, permanent participants, indigenous peoples groups, and a lot of observers. So it tells the story about an Arctic Council that is important both regionally uh, and globally. You can see the rise of uh, several uh, observers, including Russia, including China, sorry. Uh, but the pause, uh, it created a, well, it brought up the debate on what, why is the Arctic Council important? Because that's a big question, really. Why should it survive the pause? Some work has started up. And we, oh, we're all the friends of the Arctic Council, so we would like it to survive. But then we have to tell the audience why we would like it to survive, really. And I would say that there are three main reasons that, uh, that the Arctic Council should uh, survive. As you mentioned, the uh, construct of the Arctic Council is kind of unique. Uh, the indigenous peoples of the, of the Arctic are included in decision shaping and decision making in, in, in the Arctic. Council, and that is something you don't see in many other international forums. So that's why we should, that's one of the main reasons why we should uh, keep on working for the survival of the Arctic Council in these difficult times. The second reason why the Arctic Council is important is that the Arctic Council has been and still is, in a sense the main compiler of environmental and climate change research on, on Arctic issue, issues, be that on mercury, climate change, and so on and so forth. So it's important. It compiles a lot of networks, net information and research, and it has established a lot of networks uh, on, on, uh, on matters of global importance. And these, this research and this knowledge has been used in international convention work, both and in the IPCC. So it's really important in that sense. And the third dimension I would like to bring in, uh, that there will be a time, there will be a post-Ukraine war period as well. So we need to keep uh, arenas open for Russia involvement when it is politically and morally peaceful. When that is, it's impossible to say. Uh, and it doesn't look good at the moment, clearly, but um, we need to think of the future after this one. And both uh, regarding indigenous issues and especially also regarding uh, climate issue, which clearly are interlinked in the Arctic. So, uh, the Arctic Council, you should study the Arctic Council. It's an excellent uh, case for both global questions, security questions, and, well, a lot. So, thank you. Thanks, Wayne. And I think it's a, an excellent transition. Alana, 
if you could talk a bit more about the impact on our governance of, of the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Sure. Um, and I can kind of build further on the comments that have already been made that I think take us in that direction. We had the, a colleague and I had the interesting experience of preparing a document on Arctic security and governance with colleagues at the Wilson Center for the Arctic Security Roundtable at the Munich Security Conference, which some of you might know is kind of a big meeting house for especially sort of European countries thinking about the security situation. Um, and we had that, we were preparing it basically just in the weeks before the, the Russian reinvasion of Ukraine. And so we went back after and started, had to update the report, revisit some of the premises, think about what are the pressing issues and Arctic security and governance. And I think what, what I do want to share with you today is some of the things that have changed and then also some of the things that stay the same. So I think both the, the kind of abruptness and the justified how concerned we all are for outcomes in Ukraine and for the Ukrainian people, it may also, some of the challenges that we're facing Arctic governance were also there before. So also touch on some of those issues. So I think when it comes to changes, what do we see? One thing we've seen is kind of a reduction in interdependence. Of course, there have been sanctions abroad, what you might call kind of a decoupling of Russia from other European countries. For example, to take the example of the country where I live, Norway, the reduction of the businesses, investments, activities in both Russia in general and the Russia Arctic. And for a lot of analysts, this has opened a question that we certainly won't have time to, to answer, but I'll just flag it for you now is that both, of course, how to manage this decoupling and also what changes does that cause within Russia? Does it mean that Russia will be partnering more actively, for example, with other countries, for example, China in the region on security or economic issues than we've seen before? That's one. We have the kind of change in where are the relationships going? of economic interdependence, of political um, conversation. And there's a very abrupt and big change there. There's the pause in the Arctic Council, which kind of started, was initiated in March, 2022, and kind of lightened in a gradual way. I would say you had the resumption of projects, I think in June or July of 2022, and then kind of a continuation onto the transfer of the Arctic Council from, at the time, Russia held the chairship because the Arctic Council leadership rotates every two years. And then when Norway was able to resume, take its position as chair of the Arctic Council, so new opportunities opened for, for more cooperation. So I think there was a lot of reflection on, it was good that there were some tools and ways of working informally, but also that informality can have some costs for who meets, who gets information, their observers, states, indigenous peoples organizations, and states and indigenous peoples organizations being of a particular importance to how the Arctic Council is managed politically. So, so that kind of in the governance picture was a change and where we've already seen an adaptation to today's situation. And then finally, of course, one thing that's you know, certainly a, a big change is that Russia's reinvasion precipitated Sweden and Finland applying to, to NATO. And now I'm not a security expert. I know some security experts. And I would say one of the things they highlight is that okay, in a military or security sense, the game-changing aspect is for the Baltic Sea region. That that's where we're going to see kind of the biggest changes in, in how kind of rivalry or security is managed. But I think it also raises a broader question for the Arctic Council that even though the Arctic Council from its inception sort of defined out security <laughs> issues, it still wasn't, it is now a place where it will be seven NATO countries meeting Russia eventually as things at some point in the future when full, full activity may resume. So it's a question of also what will be the organizing idea narrative? Will it be possible to kind of keep that completely out of how um, Arctic Council work or Arctic relations are ordered? Is it possible to really focus in on the pragmatic issues when in some ways the big narrative that supported a lot of this development in the post-Cold War period was about kind of almost level of kind of Arctic friendship. And I think what we'll see after <clears throat> will look somewhat different. Then of course, staying the same is, is the climate change shaping the region. We have so many experts in this room who could tell us more about. We have what David Bolton, I think, is going to talk about next, also relating to new policies. I think 
it's a good thing to see that at the, the state level in Arctic states, there's been a very strong attention on developing good policies, good coordination, seeking to implement a number of good intentions. And then I think as a last point, just to round off, it's that, of course, the challenges for the of the broader geopolitical picture really came to a head for Arctic cooperation in 2022. But I think it's important to underline that things were different after Russia's annexation of Crimea in 2014 as well. That that and so that some of the cooperation that has happened has happened occurred also against a background of rivalry. But it is a matter of degree. And I think today is where we see is what sort of adaptations and responses happen when the the heat just really turned up on important sort of political and moral responses to Russia's war against Ukraine. Okay, so I guess we have okay, one last point. I scrolled up. I also think it is important to keep in mind that also some things that have stayed the same are also in Russia. So, you know, a gradual degradation and persecution of many of the organizations that made up the cooperative partners for Arctic activity over time and direct branding different important organizations, foreign agents, kind of fund, control of funding, quite a high level of um, political persecution or attention towards some of the very important actors for Arctic cooperation. And that's something that was also con has continued over time and will present a challenge for Arctic governance going forward. Great, thanks so much, Alana. And my last question is to David. And David, uh, the U.S. recently released a new national strategy for the Arctic region. What are its core components, and, and to what extent is the U.S. able to advance its priorities given the current governance environment? Thanks, Jen. <clears throat> so um, this most recent U.S. strategy in the Arctic is the fourth time in the last 30 years that our nation has actually put pen to paper and decided what we wanted to accomplish in the Arctic. Um, and rather than talk specifically about the most recent policy, what might be more interesting, at least to me, is to talk about the commonalities of over the 30 years, which are actually more um, evident than the changes. Uh, and this has cut across different parties. Uh, the first time we did this was during the Clinton administration, second time the George W. Bush administration, once before in the Obama administration, now in the Biden administration. And basically there are six themes that you will find in all four documents. And they go like this. We want to protect our nation's security in the Arctic. The Arctic's basically been a pretty peaceful and stable place, perhaps a little less so today than a few years ago, but we want to keep it peaceful and stable. That's number one. Two, we want to protect the Arctic environment. That's actually becoming harder to do because you know the Arctic is ground zero or one of the ground zeros in the world for climate change. But still, that is an important um, national objective there. Third, and somewhat in tension with item number two, depending on you ask, so we want to advance economic activity, at least in a sustainable way, for the 4 million people who live in the Arctic region um, and for others who uh, may go there to work. Um, but again, it has to be sustainable. Fourth um, relates to the way our government uh, interacts with Arctic indigenous peoples. We have in the US, profound commitments in law and policy uh, to include Native Americans, including Alaska Natives, in all decisions that affect them. And beyond that, we uh, need them as partners and as people who have a source of knowledge about the region that is different than the knowledge say, Western science produces, and finding ways to integrate those two is sort of part of that fourth objective. Fifth, we want to understand the region better. The Arctic is still, as a part of the planet, one of the less well understood areas of the world. Uh, it's hard to do scientific research there compared to some more temperate areas, and yet it's becoming even more urgent that we do so. That's number five. And six, 
we need to promote international cooperation in the Arctic, including through the Arctic Council. Uh, all of those themes you will find in the 2022 national strategy. Um, the national strategy that we issued last year was actually about ready to come out in February of 2020. Uh, and in retrospect, it's probably a good thing that it didn't, because it was in late February, of course, that the use a lot of certain reinvasion of Ukraine took place. Um, and we spent about a half a year in the US government trying to figure out what adjustments to the draft needed to be made. On the one hand, this is a strategy we want to last for a decade, and it can't be entirely about the current moment, right? On the other hand, it would have seemed kind of tone deaf not to talk about very fundamentally changed geopolitical circumstances we're now confronting in the Arctic. And so the strategy ultimately came out about a year ago, actually in October of last year, um, takes account, I think somewhat successfully, uh, of these changed circumstances. Uh, maybe in the question and answer that follows, there will be more to say about all of this. Great. Thanks very much, Dave. Um, and so now that's my foray into getting things started. Uh, I invite you to ask questions and uh, both online and in person. But if you have questions, mm -hmm. then we welcome them. We can get more specific about the particular things you're interested in. Or I can ask questions. Mm -hmm. Anyone? Oh, there we go. Mm -hmm. If you can introduce yourself, that would be great. Um, good afternoon. My name is Casey Butler. I am a National Security Fellow at the Belfer Center. Um, I really have no background in the Arctic, so this is going to be probably a very basic 101 question. Um, but I was curious what aspect of climate change uh, in, in its current state is receiving the most funding for your efforts in research? Does anyone want to take the ball? John Farrell. Down there. <laughs> yeah, John Farrell. Yeah. You have to get him a mic. Otherwise, yeah. I can't hear you online. He's the executive director of the U.S. Arctic Research yeah. Commission. He's been yeah. very capable. Uh, if anyone can answer that uh, question. In a broad yes. term, it would be environmental change, more specifically things like how ice is changing, both sea ice and glaciers and ice sheets, but environmental change in general. And I don't know, Ralph, I don't want to put you on this. That would be US specific if, if, from an international perspective. Do you have anything you would add? And just introduce yourself, please. I know I. Uh... Thank you. My name is Phil Fred, and I'm the executive secretary of the Arctic Monitoring Assessment Program. So we do run the, the um, assessment on, on climate change for our council. I would guess uh, the, the um, priorities from the Arctic uh, Council is very much in line from just that it's much on. on on um, the ice, uh, physical parameters, but also on how climate change also uh, caused displacement of, of species in Arctic, like for instance, species has been brought up from the Atlantic Ocean to the, to the Arctic Ocean, and likewise for terrestrial species and alien species, birds and, and so on. So, yeah, please, Frank. Yeah, the only thing I would add to that is. The research that is done is terribly important to the people who live there and to the companies that do business there, but the importance to the people of the world relates back to the way in which Arctic change really impacts everything globally. So let's take uh, the Greenland ice sheet contributing dramatically to sea level rise. So paying attention to the increasing rate at which the Greenland ice sheet is losing ice is of tremendous interest to the world, not just to the people of the Arctic. And similarly, the fact that sea ice is in rapid retreat and that the sea ice that remains is thinner and thinner, it's new ice, easier for ships to go through, has implications for shipping, which is why you read articles about the northern sea route and the possibility of much more shipping through the Arctic versus the Suez or the Panama Canal giving rise to all kinds of, I would describe somewhat unrealistic <laughs> expectations about how that is going to change over time. So it has economic 
as well as climate implications. So that is why an increasing amount of Arctic research, not just in the US, but globally, is focused not just on the change that is taking place, but how that change has implications globally for the people of the world. And that is why you are seeing, I think, more and more countries beyond the Arctic nations, China, the EU, Germany, etc., spending time and money researching in the region. Great. Thanks, Brian. That was great. We have another question over here. Um, my name is Zulema Cohen, first year master's in public policy here. Um, we sort of hear attention between climate change and new economic activity um, and how climate change actually opens new economic activities. And I will hear about oil, or gas exploitation, maybe minerals, or new flows. Um, what would a sustainable economy development look like in the Arctic? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. <laughs> Dave, you, you sort of opened it, so would you like to? to yeah, well, that? There, there isn't a good answer uh, to the question. So, um, one couple of obvious points. Um, a significant portion of the world's untapped oil and gas exists in the Arctic. Um, and because of the melting of the Arctic, access to some of that is becoming easier. Of course, the irony is lost on anybody who's thinking about this for even 30 seconds, that it is the very access to, and particularly the burning of fossil fuels is contributing to climate change. And there are a lot of people who think that a lot of that oil and gas would be better off staying in the ground. What kinds of sustainable economic activities might replace the economies of the North, many of whom are heavily dependent on hydrocarbons is sort of a pressing question. Um, we don't have yet a good answer. Uh, a lot of the economies in the North are still very um, dependent on natural resource, other natural resource extraction. There are subsistence lifestyles that are sustainable, right? But it's for uh, only some percentage of the population. One interesting uh, rate area could be, in addition to shipping, um, critical mineral development, which is controversial also. People like to have critical minerals, including to power a cleaner economy, but they don't magically show up on your desk. You need to dig large holes in the ground, which, of course, other kinds of environmental um, and so social issues associated with them. Anyway, I don't think we have yet come up with a good answer to the basic question, what can truly sustainable economic development in the Arctic look back over the long term if we're going to wean ourselves off of fossil fuels? Can I ask uh, Ed to comment? Yeah, if I can. Uh, Ed, <laughs> I was joking around with Dean earlier that he was going to be in the hot seat, and then uh, now I'm in the hot seat right now. <laughs> There's no seat, Matt. And you can just introduce yourself. Sure, I'm Edward Alexander. I'm the co chair of the delegation for Virginia Council International, which is a permanent participant of the Arctic Council. Um, you know, when you think about sustainable economic development, um, you know, I guess part of part of it is, is uh, what is economic development to you? And what do you consider your economy? What do you consider your your culture? Who do you who are you talking about? Who is the economy serving? Is it serving the people of the Arctic, or is it serving uh, uh, other economies elsewhere? And so those are those are important like metrics to kind of frame frame around things. You know, uh, a sustainable economy for some place where I grew up might be about managing uh, muskrat. Okay, right. So. Is it is it something that's important to the people in, in Boston? Um, it, it, you know, maybe not. But uh, does it involve food security for people in the North? It does involve food security. Does it involve uh, clothing? Yes, it involves clothing. It involves cultural activity. It involves transmission of knowledge. It involves uh, ecosystem management. It involves a lot of things, right? And so uh, that might be the same thing with uh, our interaction with fisheries. Where you know Western economies might look at fisheries as like an extraction thing for export, um, is that sustainable? 
Well, the collapse of the Bering Sea crabbery, the collapse of the Bering Sea uh, salmon fishery for uh, multinational corporations of trawling uh, shows that it's not sustainable, right? Um, the fishery, the way that managed, you know, sustainable development has occurred in the past was with managing the, the streams themselves, right? And so having people along those streams, managing those streams for the proliferation uh, of fish, right? Or the proliferation of muskrats and lakes by uh, interaction with that ecosystem. And so it's not, um, instead of looking at the, the end product of the thing that you're, you're thinking about, I think you have to think about the role of human beings in the ecosystem <clears throat> And not just uh, creating something that's sustainable, but uh, interactions of, of people with the environment that creates, um, uh, you know, a thriving, a thriving ecosystem. And then we're allowed to take the cut off the top and it's sustainable. That's great. Thanks very much, Ed and Margaret. Do you want to add them? Sure. Could, could I just add on that? We'll let Margaret go. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> hey, excuse me, I'm Margaret Williams. Uh, Arctic Fellow here at the Belfer Center, and I would just add uh, there are a number of tools that states can implement to ensure a more sustainable Arctic. One of those is, is protecting key areas of biological diversity through networks of conservation areas, networks of protected areas, managed areas, and protected areas have been shown to reduce, um, uh, increase climate resilience to enhance food security, to help guide areas for emergency response. And uh, that's that's one set of tools. There are also in each of those sectors uh, that we've talked about shipping, for example, there are a whole uh, type, there are a number of standards that can be implemented, noise reduction standards to reduce impacts on marine mammals, for example, um, waste reduction or bans on certain types of waste dumping at sea, oil spill prevention measures. So there, with each of these economic sectors, there are standards that can be in introduced. And in some cases, there should just be decisions for no-go zones, for example, for oil and gas development. There are some places that are simply too special and uh, cannot be, the, the risk is too high. Seabed mining is another area that's to come uh, where there may be no-go zones that are required as part of a sustainable Arctic. I'm thin the mic up there, but I'm going to let uh, Spain. Yeah, 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 just bring uh, just bringing in the Arctic Council again because the Arctic Council is really that venue where this kind of knowledge could is heard and being part of the decision shaping process. And that's why the Arctic Council is important, exactly because well, what you say, this is where the sustainable sustainable ideas about the Arctic uh, could be developed. So that's that's why it's important that the Arctic Council is part of Please. Hello, good afternoon. Um, Dustin Williams, I am a senior military fellow at Fletcher, United States Coast Guard. So, my question is kind of towards Margaret and the panel here. Uh, as we open access, as we put together these measures for protected areas, uh, what do you see the roles of constabular organizations to enforce and ensure safety, life, to see security through maritime governance and those aspects? Yeah. Oh. Well, we, we have an international perspective on this. We'll hear that and then see if we have some a, a U.S. perspective. So, Oleg, please. Well, I'm not sure that I cover your question very well, but uh, I think... Uh, you introduce yourself to Yeah, you. my name is Ole Bergmo. I'm a chair of the EPPR Working Group, one of the working group in, uh, in Arctic Council. Uh, I think the, to to secure the governance, of course, uh, the coast guards are important. They don't just to, to follow up. Like we have heard about fisheries that uh, they catch too much. Uh, there's not nothing left, so that's important. And uh, I know that uh, coast guard they are working together to to see how they can do this in a better way. Uh, so to the article start for them uh, as an example. That's one way to 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 share you know, knowledge and expertise uh, to 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 secure the governance as an example. Thank you. Others want to say that? Yes, just very briefly, I would say that as you probably know, the International Maritime Organization adopted something called the Polar Code a few years ago, which puts additional restrictions and requirements on certain types of ships that go through the Arctic. Right, 
but a code is a code that needs to be enforced. And the question you raise is something that many of us wonder about, whether or not the U.S. Coast Guard and the Coast Guards of other nations have adequate resources, mm -hmm. adequate tools in terms of, in, you know, artificial intelligence, satellites, etc., to really have the capacity to enforce. So <clears throat> the good news is <clears throat> the International Maritime Organization adopted a polar code. The good news is there is a, an increasing awareness of how fragile Arctic waters are and how important it is to do prevention, whether it's oil spill or anything else, and impose certain kinds of requirements like special area zones, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But at some point, the governments, particularly the Arctic, need to step up their commitment to the enforcement piece of this, or otherwise it's just talk. <laughs> Thank you. I have a question online and then we'll go up here. So, so we have a lot of questions on Zoom um, that I'm going to try and synthesize into one, but they're, uh, is it Karen? No. Hello. There we go. <laughs> um, we have a lot of questions on Zoom that I'm going to try and synthesize into one, um, but specifically we have a lot of people asking about the role of Arctic observer states, mm -hmm. um, particularly the Asian observer states. Um, and how you see their engagement with the Arctic evolving in the coming years, um, particularly as they engage with treaties like the Central Arctic Oceans Fishery Agreement. Okay. Well, I can start, but there are plenty of other people here who have, have useful things to say. Um, the Arctic Council does have a category of observers. In fact, it's an odd organization that there are eight members, six groups of indigenous peoples, and something like 40 observers sitting around the periphery when there are meetings, which there aren't currently. Uh, of those observers, I think something like 13 of them are countries from outside the Arctic region, including from Asia, Japan, South Korea, China, India, and Singapore. Yeah? All those are Arctic Council observers. When the Arctic Council is functioning properly, the observers have a significant role. They can certainly attend all the meetings of the working groups. They can contribute ideas and financing and host certain types of meetings, and uh, I would say at least uh, help to shape through these activities some of the agenda. They don't get to participate in making uh, decisions. Uh, at the moment, there are no meetings of the Arctic Council. Um, uh, it is a feature of the problems in dealing with Russia that we're at the time in the Arctic Council's history where decisions are only being made by correspondence. So the role of the observers at the moment is rather circumscribed. Um, one of the aspects of the question, though, um, has to do with a separate regime, the Central Arctic Ocean Fisheries Agreement. It's not part of the Arctic Council. There, there are um, Arctic states and non-Arctic states all on an equal footing as partners, including three from Asia, China, Japan, South Korea. And there are meetings uh, under this agreement uh, that are going on. Um, so it's not a question of observers, but of Asian states in that case being parties along with countries like the United States, Canada, Norway, et cetera. Yeah, you have a more broader cut. It lends the question, but that's what we do. Oh, I was just going did you want to say yeah, Okay, do then, you, yeah. just some words on the armed observers. In fact, I'm, I'm, at the moment, I'm writing a piece on China in the Arctic Council, and it's titled uh, China in the Arctic Council, No Drama. <laughs> so I like that title. <laughs> 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 Because what we're seeing is really that uh, the main uh, role of the observers in the Arctic Council is to provide input into the working groups. Uh, and they're not they're shaping, to some extent, decisions in, in the working groups. They are not decision makers. And if you if you like to become an, an Arctic Council observer, you need to um, acknowledge uh, the right of the indigenous groups. You need to uh, show that you have relevant uh, scientific research on Arctic issues. And thirdly, you need to acknowledge that the law of the sea is what regulates the Arctic. And just to bring in one tiny little thing, there are no territorial disputes in the Arctic. And that's important to bear in mind. And, or 
Yeah. <laughs> I'll stop there, but just, just, just so the audience know. So, a reminder. Well, if if you think it's possible to open, was the question only about observers in the Arctic Council, or is it more broadly the role of Asian states in Arctic governance or security? I think there's interest in the broader. Okay, question. so that's what I'd like to make a small comment on, kind of building on the the points that I opened with. I think one thing. So I've been kind of a student of Russia's Arctic politics and policies for a long time. And one of the things that you would see over time was that Russia was a very active proponent of Arctic cooperation. Eight countries it was a preferred format. It was a great place to meet the U.S. and work on negotiating these important binding agreements in conjunction with the Arctic Council. And also then Russia, when kind of the question of also, I won't talk too much about the Arctic Council, but when the question of how to involve observers, that was an area of interest for Russia and kind of steering up what that relationship would look like and what observers would do in the Arctic Council and so on. But I think one of the things, and I don't want, I bring it up because it's, I think, interesting and important to follow, not because you don't have all the data yet, it hasn't gone enough time. But one of the things that's interesting that I found notable about Russia's kind of Arctic Council quasi chairship that it carried out within its own country while the Arctic Council was on pause was kind of extensive outreach more than we might have anticipated based on Russia's behavior in the Arctic before Ukraine to non-Arctic countries, including China. So interestingly, China was actually one of the actors, for example, that was advocating for no restart of Arctic Council activities without Russia, kind of said it for the Arctic Circle Conference and in a few <coughs> other settings. Mm -hmm. At the same time, also during that period is also when we've seen some of the very first with the Coast Guard and coming upon Russia and Chinese military vessels engaging in some sort of joint activity in the Bering Sea in September 2022. And also recently, and it's different, these are all very difficult to interpret incidents, very single points of data. But I, I bring them up because I think it's just a reminder that even as as you know, we attempt to think of ways to sort of preserve, maintain momentum in existing settings like the Arctic Council. Of course, kind of in a broader geopolitical security setting, things continue to also change rapidly within Russia about who do they see as their partners, who do they see as allies. With of course China, as we know, being one of the a major country that has refused to condemn Russia's invasion of Ukraine. So it's a kind of a, so that comes up. In this in this setting, in a broader sense, more I think when we think about where what might be the context against which Arctic governance plays out in the the medium term. Great, thanks, Alana. We have a question up here. Hello, uh, I'm Bill Moen. I'm the director of NOAA's Untrue Systems Operations Center, but former time Arctic person. Um, I work for Senator Megan. So. Uh, I guess my question is about the Polar Code and the IMO, and there's, you know, there are other international organizations, right, that are bigger than the Arctic Council that presumably haven't been shut down by the, the Russian invasion. So I just be, in, I'm just curious about sort of how that's working, sort of how the IMO and the its uh, role in in the Polar Code and Arctic regulation is is that still chugging along because it's a bigger organization and and what do we know about polar code compliance right of the sort of curtain maybe or lack of communication with Russia happening uh, yes the IMO is still chugging along uh, indeed most multilateral forum which Russia and the United States and many other countries are engaged are still chugging along of a cooperation with Russia may not be great is moving forward um, and the IMO has been focusing on the Arctic um, in a number of ways. The Polar Code was only one such way that had mostly to do with environmental security standards for ships. But um, another decision that was made recently by the Arctic Council has to do with the phase out of heavy fuel oil use mm -hmm. and carriage in the Arctic. And there are other things that have to do with. Um, um, for example, before the most recent Russian invasion of Ukraine, there was developed between the U.S. and Russia a kind of vessel tra traffic scheme in the Bering Strait. You're nodding, you know what I'm talking about. That was blessed by the IMO. So the IMO has lots of different roles that it can play in the Arctic. Interestingly, the eight Arctic states 
where they invaded in Ukraine last year, um, were kind of Arctic block within the IMO and helped to get some of these things through. Of course, there are other countries that have interest in Arctic shipping, particularly the flag states outside the region. Um, but the Arctic states together were able to get a bunch of things done. Of course, the IMO does not move very quickly. I already know that, but it is still chugging along. Anyone else want to? Hey, my name is Matt Hange. I'm an environmental science and engineering graduate student. Um, I was just curious. Um, the U.S. is my understanding; they haven't ratified um, the United Nations Convention on the Seas. Is that affecting? <laughs> is that affecting any of uh, the the negotiations of the peace uh, um, in the Arctic um, and kind of those conversations? So the U.S. has not. Uh... Joined the 1982 UN Convention on the Law of the Sea uh, three times in the history of the Senate. They've actually taken it up, uh, but never has it received uh, full approval. You must probably know that in order to join treaties like that, you do need two thirds of the Senate. Senators voting in support have never gotten there. Um, we're the only Arctic state not to have done so. Uh, I don't know that is actually hampering our diplomacy or other efforts in the Arctic as such. Um, we have been able to join the other Arctic specific agreements, one on search and rescue, one on marine oil pollution, one on science, the fisheries agreement, the polar code, uh, despite being non-parties to the Law of Sea Convention. But here's something that is about to happen. Um, under the 82 convention, there's a process for getting other countries to recognize the outer limits of your continental shelf, then the US as a non-party is going to have um, a somewhat larger challenge to do that mm -hmm. in the Arctic and, in, and other places, I might add, uh, than parties. And yet we're just about to do that. Mm -hmm. We're about to announce to the world where we think the outer limits of our continental shelf are in the Arctic and the Bering Sea and the Pacific and the Gulf of Mexico and the Atlantic. And, off of at least one of our Pacific Island territories, how other countries are going to react to this is an interesting question. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, one last question. Yeah. 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 Online. So we have a couple of people asking about Greenland, its movement for independence, and what that might mean for Arctic governance. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a wonderful question. Yeah, I, I, I can take a stab at it. Nobody else wants to. Yeah, so, within the kingdom of Denmark, Greenland already has a great deal of autonomy and has been moving toward greater and greater autonomy over the last 20 years or more. Um, but they are still part of the kingdom of Denmark. They're not for sale. <laughs> um, Recently, uh, there was floated within Greenland um, a first draft of what might become a constitution for mm. Greenland, were they to become fully independent or at least functionally independent uh, from the kingdom. Um, most people who look at the issue, I think, including in Greenland and in Copenhagen and elsewhere, come to the conclusion that there is not yet enough ac economic activity within Greenland to support Greenland as a truly independent nation. They're still dependent on payments from the Danish crown. That could change. Um, indeed, there are plenty of people in Greenland who hope it changes. Um, and if Greenland were to become fully independent, it would raise some very interesting questions about the status of the rest of or what remains of the kingdom of Denmark. They would no longer have any territory in the Arctic region. And uh, both sort of sociologically, um, geographically, uh, Greenland might become more integrated into North America. Right now it is mostly because of its participation or membership within the kingdom of Denmark, it thinks of itself in a sort of quasi-European sense, but it might become 
more integrated with North America if it actually were to become independent. Any last questions from the room? I'm conscious of the time. Do you have one, la one last one from the online or not? And then we'll wrap I have a follow on to the Greenland question. A quick follow on from the Greenland question. Uh, the US recently opened a consulate in Nook, Greenland. Um, is this indicative of a shift in the US, Greenland, Denmark relationship? I wouldn't, I wouldn't characterize it as a shift. Yes, we did reopen a consulate in Nuuk. Um, we've also opened up a new uh, diplomatic post in Trump's in Norway. I think the two together, we also nominated for the first time in our nation's history someone to become um, an ambassador at large for the Arctic region. And all those things together, I think, are evidence of a greater degree of attention within the U.S. government to the Arctic more generally. But yes, having a consulate open in Nuuk does give us a greater voice and also a listening uh, possibility for what is going on in Greenland as Greenland. And it is part of, I think, a growing range of activity that we are undertaking, particularly in the science and research field with Greenlanders. There's a lot to do together. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree with uh, David here. Uh, I don't think we need to see this conflict both in New and Trump as like a geostrategic act. It's like it's like part of this um, uh, evolving debate on, on Arctic issues, environmental issues, climate change issues. And so, but once we have clearly, as you stated as well, uh, the issue on. Uh, Greenlandic independence, the independence is, I don't see that coming really, because then Denmark is no longer an Arctic state. So that's, that's a tough one. But clearly, that's a big headache in New and or in Greenland as such, and in the So interesting question. Great. Oh, okay. Staff, well, one last question. You know, it's not, it's just a point. The Faroe Islands, I believe, are still yeah. the territory. So unless you're assuming that Greenland and the Faroe Islands would leave. Together in some new formed independence, but without Greenland, Denmark still has claim by it. And Dave, can you well, just repeat? Yeah, so for those online who might not have heard, the question is there are actually three parts of the kingdom of Denmark <laughs> yeah. Greenland, the Faroe Islands, and of course, the continental <laughs> part. But the Faroe Islands are not in the Arctic. Let's say they're not north of the Arctic Circle. So strictly speaking, they're not in Arctic territory. <laughs> that said, within the Arctic Council, the kingdom of Denmark. As for a number of years, insisted on having three people virtually mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Greenland, our islands, and Copenhagen, which is a curiosity at best, a source of tension at work. Arctic is what you make of it, really. So, all right. Well, thank you so much. Before we go, I hope we have whetted your appetite uh, to the Arctic. We do have an Arctic course here at Harvard Kennedy School that's offered by a colleague of ours that looks at uh, a lot of these issues and touches on many of these issues. So if you have taken an interest, please feel free to contact uh, us at the Arctic Initiative and we can certainly give you more information about that. Uh, and we hope to have more events. Um, Oh, and sorry, and then box lunches outside. Uh, no. <laughs> Forget all the other pitches. There's lunch. <laughs> Thanks for.